we could theoretically end all of human suffering with one generation. More realistically, a few generations, but one is all that is required. Now, here's the catch. The solution is not all that clever. Extinction would end all human suffering. Now, there's a reason I- And that would really be the only way to do it. I mean, it's like obvious. It, like when he said, we can end all human suffering, I went, okay, so we can wipe out all humans? And he's like, and we could do it in one generation. I'm like, hmm. Wiping out all humans in one generation is not all that feasible, but you know, it maybe like that. That's a, that's a given. It's a given. The only way to end suffering is to not live. To live is to suffer. You're entitled to two things if you're alive. You know, you, there's only two things that you can actually claim. Like, hey, I I should I should have this. I want this. Everything else can be given to you or taken away from you by nature. The only two things that you're entitled to in life is suffering and death say a generation. When I say extinction, I'm not talking about some numbnuts starting a nuclear war, or some cosmic event, like a gamma ray burst occurring randomly and destroying our ozone layer in seconds, exposing all life on Earth to deadly amounts of ultraviolet radiation, or an alien civilization that views humans as nothing but pests. No, this is extinction without any violence, any killing, or against anybody's will. Extinction from the result of everyone on Earth agreeing not to have any more children. Antinatalism is the idea that procreation is morally wrong. For many of you, that may sound like nothing more than absurd pessimism, an idea born out of the mind of an emo teenager that didn't get enough hugs as a kid, an idea that is so clearly wrong and so clearly backwards, it requires no further contemplation. However, antinatalism as- It, it is kind of, mm. It does have a childishness to it because there isn't really much depth in that whole idea because people are always like, oh, uh, human beings are so bad. The world would be better off without human beings, right? The, nature would be better off, like the, the planet would be better off without humans. Better off to who? What is better off? Mean? You, you have to understand that for something to be better requires an observer to observe it and be like, this is good or bad. Like literally, it's it's like common sense. It's people who think small that that make statements like this, because, um, it doesn't it doesn't take a genius to realize one man's trash and another man's treasure. Like you could, there could be something that I'm like, man, I really really like this thing, right? And another organism would be like, man, I really hate this thing, penicillin. There's billions of organisms on Earth that absolutely despise penicillin or maybe not despise it, but it'll kill them. Um, but it's great for me. I mean, not so much anymore. I mean, like, not right now. I, I kind of, I don't want any of my microbiome. I don't want any, you know, uh, any of the bacteria on my body to die right now. Maybe if I was sick, then I'd want a pen penicillin shot. But um, like, what's good? What's like, oh, this is a better world for one organism is not better for other organisms. The only reason why we'd be like, oh, this earth would be better without human beings is because we imagine what it would be like without human beings and it would be nature thriving. That's better for us. You realize that, right? That's not better for, no, nature does not care. Nature will, will find a way to progress itself in an amoral way, regardless of humans, okay? And the reason why, like, we even care about these things is not because there's some objective, morally right way for nature to take its course and we're stopping it from doing that. It's the reason why we don't like these things is because it we're selfish and we're ruining the world for ourselves. We like the grass. We like green areas. We're taking that away from ourselves. We like oceans full of fish and coral. We're overfishing. We're ruining coral reefs. And that's literally for ourselves. Nature does not care. The trees and all the stuff and the planet and the, the rocks and, and the sun does not care. We care about these things. It's, it's human morality that is there to judge the world. And if humans are not there anymore, then we're not there to judge the world and say, this is a better world. Like it's, it's, you can kind of boil this down to like, there is no objective morality like, oh, the world would be better off without humans. That's kind of a contradiction. 
Because there is no such thing as better off. The only reason we want to preserve nature is not because there's an objective morality, but because we just like it. We like biodiversity. You know, when, when, and, and there's a good evolutionary reason for why human beings do like biodiversity. Um, but you look at like, this, this is like some Nietzsche type shit, you know, like the morality being aesthetic type shit. Like people, you know, pandas are not even endangered anymore. They're not even close to endangered. In fact, you could probably take the pandas, put them back out into the wild. A whole bunch of them would die because they've lived in captivity and they've lived with no natural predators for so long. But there's so many at this point that they would probably survive in the wild. And they, they, their numbers would go down dramatically, but they would probably survive um, if you put them in the right spot, right? And, and you had monitoring and all that. You don't need to keep all these pandas in captivity anymore. But literally millions and millions of dollars are spent every single year. Actually, millions are spent every single month, um, you know, keeping panda populations high and making them higher and higher and higher because pandas are cute. That's literally why, you know, I believe it's four bug species go extinct every single day, but nobody cares because we don't like bugs. If people are like, oh, let's be utilitarian about it. Or maybe let's just, let's, we, we, we have to prevent, we have to keep nature's biodiversity or we have to keep, uh, you know, we have to make sure nature uh, heals and these species don't go extinct. Where's all the money going to that? No one cares about the bugs that go extinct. Four species every single day. But yet we spend millions and millions and millions making sure a species that isn't even in danger any, anymore won't go extinct. And literally the reason why is it's because it's cute. And I'm not saying like, oh, this is, I'm, I'm not even saying this is a bad thing. Like this is not a bad thing in my opinion. I love pandas. If a bug goes extinct and it doesn't affect the ecosystem or whatever, I could care less. But pandas are awesome. They're so cute. When they're born, they're like the size of like, they're, they're, they can fit in like the palm of your hand and then they grow to be like absolute giants and they're so like fun and it's like Kung Fu Panda and I don't, like there's a monkey brain neuron activation. I see Panda, I like it. I think it's cute because it reminds me of myself with the two eyes and the nose and the mouth and all that stuff. That's literally what it is, okay? And um, what the hell was I talking about? Yeah, okay. So this whole like, yeah, the world would be better off without humans. Dude, the world does not care about coral reefs. We care about coral reefs. If there is no us anymore, then there is no like person to appreciate the coral reefs. You have to be a bit smarter than that and you have to be a bit stronger than that to to practice this kind of like um to be a, a moral paragon for your own ideals. You have to not only say that like humans are, deserve to be on earth, but we should actively fight for what we want in the world, right? Because that's really what it is. In the grand scheme of things, we really aren't even alive. We're just we're like the self-replicating entropy machines doing the universe's work, you know, consuming energy and making more and more particles reach ground state and run out of energy. And that's literally, that's what the universe does. And that's what we do as an extension of the universe, as a part of the universe, right? We're on a giant rock floating through space on a pale blue dot. Nobody cares if the pandas go extinct. We care. We like it. Um, but if I say, oh, we kill, forget the pandas, kill everyone's like, oh, oh, how could you say that? Yeah, no one is like morally whatever, you know? There's individual morality. There is no objective, grand, divine morality. It's on an individual level. So this is a childish concept. But, you know, let's watch. Maybe I'm completely wrong. And Simple as there's it. something to wa learn from this. This premise is contains much more than meets the eye, and the philosophy around it brings up a lot of interesting questions. The discussions and writings of the people who advocate for it, along with those of the people who are against it, say a lot about how we think about and value morality, rationality, logic, duty, and life itself. As you can imagine, the subjects I'm going to explore get extremely dark, so those who are not sound of mind or are made uncomfortable by these kinds of conversations, I would advise to click off this video. And I would advise, if you fall into that category, 
or if you think you do, or if you think you're on the fence, or if you think you all fall under 1%, just avoid all liability. Don't watch my videos ever again. In fact, just like block me, just like, um, you know, uh, like if, if this is on your recommended, then like click on the three dots and be like, don't recommend this channel to YouTube and stuff like that, you know? I don't want anybody like who's like sensitive to these kinds of things watching me. Uh, you know, there's bouts here and there depending on like whatever tragedy you're going through in life. But, you know, generally speaking, I don't want like... Mm, I'm trying to say the right words to not piss off YouTube because I already have a strike on my channel. But you know what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying. Disclaimer, ultimate disclaimer. I say everything bad all the time, ever. Um, and so if you don't like that, then leave. I'll also have to ask you to leave any knee-jerk reactions at the door, as this subject- Damn it, I gave a knee-jerk reaction. Oh, well. ...it messes with some of our most primal drives, and obviously many people will foster a lot of prejudgment without hearing about what antinatalism actually entails. I'm okay, okay, maybe I was too quick to judge. Let's see what it actually does entail. I'm going to present antinatalism as objectively as I can. The arguments and ideas about antinatalism- I don't think there's all that much value in project like projecting stuff as or presenting stuff as objective like yeah okay fine go ahead do that but i i think people overvalue objectivity and this this argument about objectivity and subjectivity plays right into uh objective and subjective morality and i talk about this a lot in like a different stream but um you know, I'll leave that in the description, actually, of this of this clip. Let me add it here. ...are fascinating in a morbid way. If you're optimistic about life and still open-minded, you may find this as an interesting counter-perspective on an issue most people don't even question. And if you're one of those people who wish they'd never been born, you might find comfort in the fact that you're not alone. Antinatalism is not unprecedented. Even in the Bible, there are a few passages that allude to the idea, but most do not endorse it. Probably the most famous is Matthew 26, 24. For the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago, but how terrible it would be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Today, Catholic nuns and- Uh, okay priests are not allowed to get married or have children. A similar antinatalist sentiment has been made by Sophocles, and wishing never to have been born is even a line in one of Queen's most famous songs. Damn, look at those chompers on Queen, bro. And wishing never to have been born- Look at them, look at those chompers. ...is even a line in one of Queen's most famous songs. The sentiment that one should never have been born has probably been a recurring idea throughout all of human history. Given the amount of suffering in today's world, and the even greater suffering of the past, one could see how someone in any time period could come to the conclusion that existence itself is bad, and the perpetuation of that ex- Well, existence is suffering. I don't think that's an unreasonable conclusion to come to. I guess it depends on the person. Um, do you view suffering as bad, you know? And it's not necessarily like a uh, one-size-fits-all, and it's not necessarily even that if, if you can describe this thing that entails what all of life will be as bad, that you should no longer be or you should wish that you never became in the first place, right? Because... Human beings did not evolve to be happy. We evolved to procreate and survive and keep the species alive. That's what we're made, made for, okay? We're not made to be happy all the time. Existence is bad. If a few societies of the ancient past did- it Doesn't mean you can't choose that. Choose whatever the hell you want. But it's not what our, what our evolution and our, um, like, lens that we view ourselves in like if some tragic thing happens to us we may feel so bad that we may feel like we want to you know take our own lives we evolved that way for a reason okay people could you know maybe people could have evolved like some people could have evolved to not feel anything when something tragic happens to their lives and they're only happy all the time um, but that wouldn't be very useful in the grand scheme of evolution. But, you know, it's a different world now.
seriously agree to be anti-natalist, then obviously their existence would be very short and would likely be lost to the ashes of history. Today, there are a rare few groups that view procreation as a negative. So and you know what? Pretty soon, they're all gonna disappear if they truly believe it. In fact, I doubt there's anyone that believes it truly. Because if they did, then they wouldn't be around. Maybe there are people now that believe it that are, it's starting to emerge because of this transitory period in the world. But, um, I mean, this is sort of like a thing that's like a loss of the ashes of time. This is a thing that might pop up occasionally throughout human history over the next, you know, 100,000 years or so. But eventually it's just going to all disappear, basically, because these kinds of people with this kind of proclivity just wouldn't survive. And a lot of people might say they would you know, be anti-natalist, but actions speak louder than words. The simple fact that they're still alive proves that like, hey, bro, you ain't as anti-natalist as you might think. And if you are, then I guess this is actually, ah, oh, shit. I mean, look, if you want to talk about action speaking louder than words, Bro, there's a case to be made here that the anti-natalist community, like the real only anti-natalist community is LGBT people, LGBTQIA plus or whatever, and A is asexual, right? So it covers everything. It really covers everything. It's everything except for people that want to procreate. Holy shit. Wait, I think that's it. If, if you're just talking about pure actions, right? People that, that are not straight that are not attracted to the um, opposite sex. Or mm, you could you could take it a step further and say people who choose to avoid their own desires for, uh, you know, their attraction to the opposite sex, that these are the people that are antinatalist, whether they, you know, prescribe their that, that label on themselves or not, you know? as the voluntary human extinction movement, where, according to their views, voluntarily not reproducing would prevent environmental degradation. The shaker- There you go. There you go. That's exactly what I'm saying. Environmental degradation. It's only degradation because we consider that degradation because we have a word for degradation. The, the rest of the universe does not care. The rest of the universe might consider it an enhancement, you know? Other animals might consider it an enhancement. If what we're doing to nature, you know, the degradation we're doing. There's a Christian sect founded in the 1700s is entirely celibate. Procreation was forbidden after they joined the society and members were added through indenture, adoption, or conversion. As you can imagine, their communities eventually declined. As of 2019, there was only one active Shakers community on earth. On the other side of the Christian spectrum, you have the Quiverful, a group of conservative Christians who shun the use of contraception and basically have as many children as possible. Holy Ironically, shit. Ironically, the Quiverful movement may have more real-world controversy than the opposite extreme. Professor David Benatar... Yeah, they're really... There's, a, there's evolutionary dangers to both. ...is the leading philosopher on antinatalism. He's a mysterious figure, never showing his face and rarely giving personal details about his life, especially whether he has children or not. He wants his arguments to be viewed on their own. His fascinating book, Better Never to Have Been, gives a comprehensive argument in favor of his version of antinatalism. Now I say version because antinatalism is one simple idea that can have several implications depending on what you mean specifically. Hmm. Antinatalism simply means anti-procreation. It could but does not automatically mean that the legal right to having a child should be taken away or that people should be forcibly sterilized. One could have some antinatalist views, but also think abortion, for example, should not always be pursued. There is a big difference between aborting a fetus and choosing not to even conceive in the first place. Yeah. Okay, I see what's going on here. I see, I see. Yeah. There is a big difference between determining whether a life is worth starting or whether a life is worth continuing, if you believe a fetus is considered a living human being. As you will learn, antinatalism does not automatically mean pro-mortalism. The first argument Benatar puts forth is that I think from a grander perspective it does. I think from from a from a 
once again, this is a childish endeavor. This is a, it feels, you know, like, um, like, a, a for example, let's say there's a, a pregnant woman, right? And I'm having an argument with a dude about abortion. In fact, I did have this conversation with a dude about abortion, but there was no pregnant woman there. I would have been like a real enlightening if there was. I would have loved to see that. But I was like, he was like, it's it's literally nothing. Like a fetus is, is literally nothing. It, uh, um, it's not a human, like it's not a life at all, right? He was like real extreme with it. Like it's it's nothing. And I'm like, it's not nothing. It's clearly something. Would you kick a pregnant woman in the stomach, uh, like basically killing the fetus? Or not killing, he's like, it's not killing the fetus. He's like trying to be so specific with words. I'm like, okay, would you prevent the fetus from becoming a human by kicking her in the stomach if it, if it wasn't going to hurt her, right? And he was like, yeah, I would. And I'm like, damn, there's no arguing at this point. Like, that's it. Argument's over. He wins. But um, it's like pregnant women, right? right? Even if there's nothing there and... You just, a woman just finds out she's pregnant. Her behavior will change. It's not nothing. Like she will, uh, instinctively, if someone comes at her, she will use her arms to cover up, um, like her belly area. Even if she has no, even if it's literally just a zygote and it's nothing. And she just got a pregnancy test. And without that test, she would never have known that she was pregnant. Just the knowledge that she's pregnant uh, will change your behavior enough to be like, okay, yeah, this is clearly something. It's not nothing. Human, whatever the word you want to call it, not human, uh, not a lie, whatever you want to call it, right? It's something. It's something. So, um, like, these things, like, oh, I would be antinatalist, but at the same time, I wouldn't want to, um, like, uh, uh, condone abortion, right? It's the same, all of this is the same sort of mentality. It's the same sort of childish mentality of like, I'm, I feel like this thing is right. I feel like this thing is wrong. And these feelings, these proclivities just come from the way we're wired from nature, just from evolution. And that's literally, um, all people are doing, just expressing that and going like, not only do I feel this way, I feel like you should follow my opinions as well. That's all this comes down to. It's actually a very simple Simple thing. You can't have overpopulation. The reason why people have these desires to, uh, you know, not allow families to have too many people in their family or whatever is because <clears throat> when people have too, when there's too much crowding of population, when there's less intimacy in society um, and Dunbar's number it becomes ignored, essentially, um, it usually spells chaos. It usually spells chaos because... Uh, as a result, they will, the population, if they become, you know, invasive uh, and there's no predators for them, they will grow to such an insane amount that um, they'll wipe out the biodiversity around them, which is once again why we like biodiversity, which is once again, uh, the only reason why we like these things is to continue the procreation of humans. To continue the procreation of humans, you have to find a balance. You can't just say more and more and more humans, 9 billion humans, 10 billion humans. No, if you want to continue human beings, you know, a hundred thousand years from now, you have to, you can't go like, yeah, let's have a hundred billion human beings on earth. You can't do that. You literally can't. Um, you run the risk of humans going extinct if you, if you go overboard with it, you know? So we have these mechanisms within us. It makes you wonder why the hell, I shouldn't say why the hell, like that it, I, I talk this way, but this is going to get me banned one day. But it makes you wonder where, like, the whole LGBT stuff fits into all this. Because it, it, it's it's got to play into this in some way, right? I'm not trying to make any implications here. But it's like, that might be an interesting thing to think about. Because, like, other animals, when they become very, very, very prosperous, also exhibit LGBT-like behaviors. This never happens in nature when there is just a normal ecosystem but when an animal basically enters like a like a resource utopia and they they don't have to um 
worry about food or water or anything like that or any the, fulfilling any of their basic needs. They don't have to worry about predators or play or uh, like the struggles of finding a sexual mate in a, in a very competitive environment and things like that. They start exhibiting uh, homosexuality and a lot of other things like degeneracy, cannibalism, all that stuff. Like this has been seen in rats and dogs and all that kind of thing. But it never really happens like in nature, nature. But we don't live in nature, nature. So there's there's clearly something else going on there. There's clearly some some wired. If anything, LGBT should, people should not be offended. Or if anything, they should be like, yeah, true. It's not a choice. I hear that all the time. Being gay is not a choice. Exactly. There's a there's a deep genetic component probably because it exists in other animals as well. It only manifests in certain environments. It's only like a reaction to certain environments, you know. But it could be a it could be a basically a deterrent from populations rising too quickly. Maybe. I don't know. Something to think about. Coming into existence is always a harm. He argues this through something he calls the asymmetry of pleasure and pain. Benatar argues that the presence of pain. Okay, no, no. I always saw this this whole thing as kind of stupid. Like the pl the pain of the thing is always going to be way worse than the pleasure of the thing. I saw this as like really. Like I don't agree with this. Maybe this is like an experience to experience basis, but. If there's at least one person in the world who can look at a situation and be like, like, okay, for example, there's everything in this is going to be edge case scenario. There was no, there was no perfect middle ground to be like, yeah, this is the thing. This is the example to be like, ah, this is what pleasure and pain. No, 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 no. Um, an example could be, and not that this even matters, but an example could be like, my dad had a rule and it was that you have to try every kind of food. Um, if there's a new food that we come across in a restaurant or something like that, or someone brings us some food or my mom makes some food, anything new, I have to try it at least once. At least one bite I have to try. doesn't even matter. And I was never allergic to anything, so I was totally cool. Um, but it doesn't matter how terrible it looks, how terrible it smells. I have to try at least one bite. Um, and like 90% of the things I hated. But the 1% of things, or the 10% of things made up for it. Like it literally made up for it to the point where that rule was actually worth it. Um... And none of that even matters. If if human beings are, you know, evolution wires us to do certain things, right? It wires us to go in certain directions. And the only reason why it does is because it wires everyone to go in all different directions and the people that don't go in those directions die. But essentially, and they don't pass on their genes, but basically there's two ways to make an organism do something. You could pull them towards it or push them away from it. Pulling them towards something is like giving them some kind of a reward. Um, and these are all your, you know, positive quote unquote chemicals. These are all your reward chemicals, chemicals that will reinforce myelination in the brain for the, for whatever neural pathway that neurotransmitter just went down. So if you, you know, if someone tells a dog jump and then gives it a treat and it gets a little dopamine hit from that treat, that pathway that made it jump when it heard the word jump will be reinforced and strengthened and it'll fire over and over and over again while it sleeps. So that way it knows, hey, next time this happens, if I want that dopamine again, I'm going to jump. Um, there's pathways to reward people and, and pull people towards things. Organisms, right? Organisms, not people, any, any organism. And there's also pathways to push people away from things, push organisms away from things like pain and discomfort and anxiety and... Uh, uh, all these different, you know, sadness and, you know, these sorts of things. And anger could be right in the middle. Anger could be pushes you to do things and not do it. But um, there's like, if you get poked by something, that sends a signal of pain. And that's like, hey, no, nah, I don't want that. Let me go away from that, right? It's, it's punishment. So there's punishment and reward. And nature, all nature needs to do is to push you in a certain direction, whether it does it by pushing you or pulling you, it doesn't really matter. It'll do both. Nature's parsimonious. It'll do everything all the time. It'll punish you if you go towards the thing you're not supposed to go to. And it'll uh, reward you if you go towards the thing that you're supposed to go to. Um, and there's very little things in life that are just neutral that don't give you a punishment or a reward, you know? Now, if it's a case-by-case -case 
thing. And like some people just have the natural tendency to where um, re rewards just feel nicer to them. And other people have the natural tendency to where just brain chemistry wise, uh, punishments feel way worse to them and the average person. Then maybe that's just that's just a thing that that people that exists and there's really no like um the world should be like this that i'm trying to say here it's just observations that i'm making but for me i don't know man i i feel for most things in my life like the pleasure of winning is way better than how bad the pain of losing is and to some people it's different I know to, let's say, for example, the top players of any given profession, right? Athletes or uh, mathematicians or whatever, or things like that. Like basically pro players and any pro, even like pro video games, I believe, um, like esports and things like that, but especially sports. If you look at the way they, they uh, you know, speak and the way they operate and the way they behave, it's very clear to them that winning feels okay, but losing feels like like hell okay um that isn't the case with me i i'm okay to i'm okay losing i don't know i guess i'm just destined to be happy you know maybe that's just how it is because to me i'm okay with being a beginner when someone says hey you want to uh play this game with all of us i i find it weird when my, i ask my friends that and they go no i'm not good at the game to me that i don't even think about that at all i think to myself will that game be fun if I'm not good at the game, will it be fun to learn? Will it be fun to ask them like, hey, how do you do the most basic thing in this game? You know, even if it's something I have no idea how to do. I don't mind being a beginner. I don't mind showing people that I'm a beginner. I don't mind, you know, as long as it's a fun thing. And even when games are not very fun, I always usually find ways to have fun in them. So there's a, there's a conversation to have about happiness but in terms of what people ought to do or whether or not human beings should exist or not, I don't think it's something that people can say definitively about anybody other than themselves. It's bad. Or rather their own genetics, if you want to take it a bit a step further and be like, I don't want to procreate. Go for it, you know? Your choice, your genetics. And the presence of pleasure is good. I would say basically everyone agrees with that. No, 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 no. That's the problem. And the pressure and pain. Benatar argues that the presence of pain is bad and the presence of pleasure is good. No, no. That's something that you have to prove. That's not a given. And the fact that like some people think this is a given is is one of the driving factors in so much of the ignorance in today's society and so much of the miscommunication between people about like why people watch the movies they do, why people resonate with the stories they do, why people, uh, you know, will treat the opposite sex in this way or why people want this kind of life or they they push for others to, to be the, their best selves. And this goes deeper into like, you know, living a non-sentary lifestyle or argument, the argument about bullying in school and letting kids do what they want to do, things like that. Like this, this goes really deep. You have to like, um, if you, if you want to make the, like, uh, if you want to claim that pleasure is good and pain is bad, you have to prove that because that's not self-evidence. In fact, it's not, it seems to be like 50, 50 to me, like 50% of pleasure is good. 50% of pleasure is bad. 50% of pain is good. 50% of pain is bad. I would say basically everyone agrees with that. It seems like in today's world where we're not living in nature, where you can't just taste pleasure and things work out for you, you have to voluntarily accept some pain if you want to live a truly meaningful life. But he also points out that the absence of pain is good, even if that good is not enjoyed by anyone. Whereas the- mm, No. There is no, there is no, there is neutral at best for that. This comes across as the kind of thing that, that a weak person would think, in more ways than one, but... The absence of pleasure is not bad, unless there is somebody for whom this absence... No, if the absence of pleasure is not bad, then the absence of pain is not... I don't know what the fuck I'm saying, but you get what I'm saying. You can't have your cake and eat it too. This is a deprivation. It can be easier to think of it like a chart with four quadrants. One call... Whoa, 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 whoa. Not bad, not good. 
not bad, not good. You can't, you can't have it both ways like this. That's why this is wrong, but. Some where someone does exist and another where someone doesn't exist. And that's the thing. This is the whole crux of the argument right here. This is where things get fucked up. Because if we don't exist, there is no uh, good to be had with an absence of pain. It doesn't exist. So like, yeah, no, there, there is not anything. There is nothing. And there is nothing right here. So if human beings don't exist, then there's nothing. There is no good or bad. As you can see, there is no like judgment to make on like, ah, now the world is good. There's no one to judge to say that it's good anymore. Scenario B is the only scenario where there is guaranteed no bad. If you can know in it, but that's wrong. That's literally wrong. But advance that the child you brought into existence was going to spend a majority of its life in pain. I think most reasonable people would not bring that child into existence. No, it's not most reasonable people. That's stupid. Most of your life will be spent in pain. Babies come out the womb crying. Like, we're always in pain all the time. We just learn to deal with it. Like, um, the pain of digestion is actually, like, excruciatingly unbearable. But we learn to, uh, you know, before we develop any sense of, like, forming memories, we, our brain learns to, learns to ignore it. Um, the pain of... Uh, for example, you know, chewing like with your mouth, like your jaw, your, your uh, TMJ, right? There's a bone like right at the top, of, right, your bottom jaw has a bone that basically like um, slides across a ligament on your top jaw in the very back. And that's how you get that like uh, basically like that joint thing. So there's the there's basically that like wheel and axle joint, the like articulation, and then your jaw protrudes forward if you open your jaw enough. And on that area, it isn't just like a, it isn't just like a joint. It, your bone slides across uh, a ligament, and it's extremely painful. It's a bone sliding across that, but it's extremely painful. But your brain learns to ignore it. Um, and okay, you could say your brain learns to ignore all these pains, but that's part of being in pain you adapt. It's hedonic adaptation. It works the other way as well. Most of everyone's life will be in pain. If a reasonable person decided that, man, my child is going to go through pain the most of their lives, let me not give birth, and that's a reasonable idea, then nobody is reasonable. Benatar agrees that if you could know in advance that the child you bring into existence would live a life completely without suffering, then this asymmetry would not apply. However, but you can be absolutely sure that your kid... Okay, never mind. I already explained it. We all know this is impossible. There is no human life, not even the most wealthy, healthy, and privileged among us, who experience zero suffering. It may be a bitter pill to swallow, but by bringing someone into existence with the knowledge that they will experience suffering, even if you believe small amounts of suffering, you are, sort of, in a weird way, partially responsible for that person's suffering. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's such a scary thought to think about. Like, I don't think that's such a, like, um, I mean, I guess it depends on the person. Because for me, like, my parents brought me in here. They're responsible for the suffering I went through when I was little. But I don't see that as such a big deal. Like, they're slaves to their sex organs. And so am I. We're just going about being alive is all we're doing. Doing what humans do, surviving, procreating, growing, changing, reacting to our environment. And like, I don't know, I, I don't blame them for that. But I, at the same time, I know some people do. I know some people are literally out here like, man, I wish I wasn't born. I guess these two go hand in hand. I guess if you wish you weren't born, then you'd also, may, maybe there's a strong overlap with those kinds of people and also people who are antinatalist, you know. But this is not such an uncomfortable thought to me that I, 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 I'm i one day going to give birth, maybe if I end up, not me giving birth, but I'm one day going to uh, bring a, a baby into the world, bring another human being into the world, um, knowing that they will go through a lot of suffering. Like, yeah, I don't feel so 
maybe it's different when I maybe it'll be different when I have kids if I ever have kids. But I don't feel any um, sort of apprehension against that sort of thing. Now it depends on the kind of suffering. If it's if it's like a if I was born in in a slave labor camp and I was tortured every day and they were going to torture my kid, then yeah, no. But then again, I guess people might look at the lives that we have right now as torture. Like we're being tortured by our senses and by nature and by our parents and society and whatever the hell else people might view it as. But I guess I'm just so privileged and I just have such a good life that I don't view it that way. I view the... I, I view the probability that my kids also being antinatalist as very low. And that's really what'll like, I mean, that that's, that's at the end of the day, what'll cause me to um, procreate. This is a general outline of his first argument. And there are of course, several counters that people have made about the premises that he discusses in his book. This is just a simple introduction. To many of you, this robotic way of approaching pleasure and pain may not be very convincing. I don't think it's not convincing because it's robotic. I think it's not convincing because it's wrong. But as Benatar argues further, our lives may be considerably more bad than we believe. How good do you think your life is? I want you to seriously consider this question. I really don't know. Because, because this is a relative question. You have to compare it to, to the lives of others. How good is your life relative to the average human being? Who knows? How good is your life relative to what a, a normal human being is intended to do with their lives according to nature? Um, I, I mean, I could take an educated guess, but it's only a guess. And, and there's no like set instructions on how people should live their lives given to them by nature. But, you know, there's like, um, if anything, you could say a, a much more complex version of that is what we're already doing. Um, but there's like natural tendencies people tend to have. Um, how good is my life compared to the worst possible life? Pretty damn good. How good is my life compared to the best possible life? Honestly, I don't not, I don't think it's much different. I don't think it's all that much different. So maybe that's just me. Maybe it's just me that sees it this way, but. If you're not in a war torn or developing country, if you. But that's the thing, it, this is all relative. Because war torn, okay. Honestly, dude, I would say the United States is at war with like 70 different countries right now, but it's a tech war. It's a war of hackers. Like these, these governments hire hacking teams to literally like blow up pipelines in other countries around the world. And um, they just claim that they're not at war because it's not a war that the average person sees with their own eyes. So it's like, but it is, it is a war. And then these people who are at war, it, there's, there's a Geneva Convention and there's rules to war and it's like a game and, you know, you have to be a certain age to be drafted and things like that. It's very civilized. People, you know, 50,000 years ago would be like, yo, dog, you get to choose who gets to be drafted. You get to just like, you know, live on your farms and, you know, like not have to deal with uh, being drafted if you're a woman or if you're, you know, not an able-bodied man or you're underage or you're injured or whatever. Bro, I don't have a fucking choice. Like I have thorns in my feet because I have no shoes. It's painful every single day, but I still have to run and hunt and provide for my family. And we're at war with fucking woolly mammoths. And that's a war that I have to bring my kids into. And it doesn't matter who the hell you are if you're a you know, 80 year old man or a three year old girl, it's a war you have to fight and you have to see with your own eyes. Like those people in war torn countries today might, it, it depends on, on really, it depends on their lens of themselves. They might view themselves as extremely privileged as like in the top 1% of all humans to ever live in terms of happiness, in terms of pleasure versus pain ratio. Who knows, you know? And does the ratio matter? Is is it a sufficient amount to be 50% uh, pleasure and 50% pain? Or what about 50% pleasure and 50% pain relative to the average of human beings? Like the, these are like, it's all, it's all personal. It's all personal. I have nobody else I can compare my own life to in terms of like a deep qualia 
uh, measure. In fact, I, I don't even know if everyone else exists. I think therefore I am the whole, you know, Occam's razor. But like, uh, who was that? Descartes. That was Descartes. Yeah. But um, yeah, again, these, these are childish arguments. These are childish thoughts. But I like being childish. Let's, let's keep watching. You don't have cancer or some other major disease if you have all your senses and limbs and if you are not in extreme poverty but that's the thing these are all relative i have five senses well really i have like eight or nine what is it five senses and then balance kinesthetic sense um pain um temperature uh that's nine is proprioception a sense I don't know. Maybe ten, I don't know. We got a few senses. I guess proprioception is not a external stimuli sense. No, but um, uh, the balance is not either. Well, gravity. Okay, whatever. I'll I'll lump proper. I don't know. People have different definitions. But what if there's like fifty senses? Oh, I only I only have three senses. I I don't have sight and a uh, hearing. I'm. Well, they wouldn't be saying that if they didn't necessarily hear it. But if somebody didn't have two out of the three senses that people, the three mainstream senses, they'd be like, man, I'm so, my life sucks. But we all have like five senses. What if the normal is like 50 and human beings only now to today experience this many? And But we never know about the rest of it. Is suffering, is pain and suffering only contingent on the on the knowledge that other people are doing better than you? Or because without that knowledge, would you know how terrible your life actually is? There's unlimited room for, uh, uh, um, you know, sensing infrared and sensing um, like the chemical senses that other animals like snakes have or the sense like even magnetism, electromagnetism, which some humans apparently have actually. Um, it's very, very minor senses of electromagnetism. Um which might might actually play into some of an ex somewhat of an explanation on why some people just seem to have a really good grasp on future weather events because the same sort of animals that are able to you know very accurately predict whether or not it'll be hurricane season and things like that much much more powerfully than our computers and things like that can simulate those are the same animals that have um, electromagnetism like basically built in compasses for uh, migration and things like that. So just interesting. I, uh, this is a tangent completely unrelated to the video, but it's just interesting to think about like there's unlimited range for the qualia of our lives, quality, qualia, I'm saying qualia and quality, but there's unlimited range. It could be unlimited, good, unlimited, bad to say that we're anywhere on the scale and that we're more higher than, than like we're, we're closer to the highest than we are to the lowest or closer to the lowest than we are to the highest is foolish. It's negative infinity and positive infinity. Probably think your quality of life is tolerable, if not good, if not very good. However, even for those in privileged positions, you face frequent discomforts and pains. How frequently are you not too hot or too cold, but at just the right temperature? How often are you in a comfort? That's interesting though. I mean, I know people that when they're not at the right temperature, they'd be upset. Bro, if it's 30 degrees outside, I'd be like, yo, let's go outside. It's an adventure. I get to feel cold. I get to feel some pain. Maybe it's masochistic of me. Um, but then I'd make an argument, hey, maybe masochism isn't that bad. Fine. On a sexual level, it's a different thing. But then again, everything come, boils down to sex at the end of the day. I like a fucking... God damn it. This... I hate talking about philosophy because it always goes into this. It always devolves into like um like uh oh what is the objective the reality behind this thing and then i'm always like well first we have to ask does objectivity even exist and then it, it's like i can't do any philosophy i can't get anywhere with it that's why i can never be a philosopher because i can't come to any actual conclusions about life or whatever um unless i'm just like you know spouting shower thoughts or have like high thoughts or whatever and I'm, I'm, you know, really fucking like, I'm really feeling myself and I'm like, yeah, dude, my word is the fucking word of law, nature of law, dude.
comfortable position? How often are you fully rested? How often are you hungry? When the discomfort up here is satisfied, in only a few hours there will be discomfort down here. What about mentally? How often are you completely sound of mind? Not thinking about some project you have to complete, some chore, not obsessing over some insult or insecurity. Yeah, I don't want to watch this video. I don't want to watch it. I don't, the video is not making me feel good. And I don't want to chase things. I don't want to, I, I want to chase things that make me feel good.